Did you know, dear watcher of this video, that the PlayStation 1 has over 5,000 games on it? Actually, scratch that, it's over 7,000 titles. Library-wise, our humble little gray square completely dwarfs both of its competitors in the Sega Saturn and the Nintendo 64. True, a lot of those PlayStation titles were just Japan-exclusive visual novel-type games, but that is truly a massive amount of games to play, most of which I've certainly never heard of. One of those random unknown titles, though, is the topic of today's video. This one came as a recommendation from my best friend. Not because he played this title as a lad, but because he heard about it on a podcast. What is Punky Skunk? Where they, I don't oh, know. What is Punky Skunk? Thrash, skate, <laughs> dig, glide, and jump past mutant mice to win uh -oh, for one player. <laughs> Submitted for the approval of YouTube Society, I present to you a review of the game Punky Skunk. Developed by a short-lived company from Japan, Uki Yotse, whose full catalog of games was so small I can actually comfortably put it right here on the screen. Yeah, it's not the most impressive listing, that's for sure. When Hook, Spawn, and Skyblazer are your company's heaviest hitters, you know we might be in a bit of trouble here. Punky Skunk saw released first in Japan on November 1st of 1996, with a subsequent drop in the North America on February of 1998. Before I get into the game proper though, I found out that Punky Skunk actually has a pretty interesting backstory. Initially, this game was being developed for the SNES under the title Metamoron Kid Goomin as a commission for a company called Bulletproof Software. Close to the release of that particular title, though, Bulletproof Software decided to go in a different direction from mascot action platformers, so the game ended up being shelved. The project was later revived under another publisher called Visit, who shifted the game's focus towards a Western audience, with them directly taking into account input from Western consumers. This input led to the creation of Punky Skunk himself, Self, of course, which happened because I guess North American audiences were very much into Pepe Le Pew at the time. I don't know. Development thusly began once again on a game called Cooley Skunk, and it actually managed to basically get finished for the Super Famicom, it even getting shown off at a couple game conferences in Japan. Unfortunately for this title, the release of the PlayStation 1 in the USA and an alleged decline in the interest of 16-bit games led to it never actually being released officially. Unwilling to stay dead though, the game once again began development, but this time for the PlayStation 1, with its development finally going off without a hitch and the game being released onto the PSX. The status version of the game was considered lost media until just a few years ago, which is really the interesting story here. You see, a demo of the SNES version of this game was actually offered as a download via, get this, the Nintendo Satellaview, which was an add-on for the Super Famicom that allowed you to download games via satellite to the peripherals cartridges. By sheer luck, a cartridge with a demo of the SNES version was found decades later in 2019 in a Japanese video game store called Super Potato. The cartridge ended up being purchased by a gaming Alexandria user by the name of Bill Cat Socks, who, with the help of some generous donations from other users, footed the $500 price tag. The ROM would later be dumped online, and thereafter, another user of the same site, Master Fox, found out with a little bit of tinkering, the demo could be unlocked and you could play the full SNES version of the game, which is now playable if you're interested in playing this and the PS1 version. And that's how a lost SNES game was. Your almost sheer luck was saved from its lost media status. Let's get back to the game proper, though. I've gotten way too off track here. Punky Skunk on the PS1 has a pretty simple plot. When it drops you into almost immediately, Immediately. Punky declares that he's gonna take down a villain by the name of Badler. Yeah, it's a little on the nose, huh? Alongside his army of mice that are known as the BB Brigade and its commander Chu, his friends Mad Scientist slash Inventor Nash and Pink Rabbit Kelly, who basically becomes Punky's scout and spy master since she always lets you know how to beat the bosses when you fight them in game, throw their lot in with Punky here. If you're curious as to why these two are fighting, Badler, much like your average Captain Planet villain, is poisoning the water supply, burning the crops, and delivering a plague onto all their houses, till the heroes set off on their journey to bring him down. Gotta be honest, Punky, I don't appreciate your ass cloud telling me to chill. Hey everybody, chill out. <laughs> on its face, Punky Skunk is a mascot platformer. 
Punky can walk, jump, and fart in self-defense. You can collect stars, a hundred of which rewards you with an extra life. You can also just grab one-ups for extra lives too. Punky has a life bar which consists of these green balls here. These can be replenished by picking up more balls, green being one, the rainbow ball or filling your life bar entirely. You can even extend your life bar by collecting ball fragments hidden around the game's various stages. Enemies will also frequently drop these pickups too, meaning you can play pretty fast, loose, and reckless in the levels. Which I did, of course. Pretty frequently, actually. The level also takes the time to teach you about the first gadget your friend Nash makes for you. The paraglider, as they game calls it. This gadget lets you glide across the world and will carry you in various directions if you get caught in an updraft of any kind. You'll quickly finish the first mission and the whole first island basically functions as a big tutorial for two different things. One, your gadgets, and two, the mini games you can run across. The mini games are generally hidden in the levels too, but if you find and successfully complete them, you get some good rewards overall. Your mini games include, Simon says, via raising and lowering the correct flag, boring. Mashing on a bike till you have the appropriate charge on four separate bikes. Kind of annoying, but okay. One time I did this game and I didn't even have every bike in the blue level, but I still won just fine. Slots! It's just gambling, but easy enough to win in a matching game. Also pretty easy. Generally, these are all just nice little games to find and help top off your resources as you're playing the game. As for the stuff that really matters though, you'll get to use each of the gadgets your boy Nash has cooked up for you in the rest of this first island. Generally, you only have access to one of these tools, and the level you're playing on will be built around using said gadget. You have the aforementioned hang glider, of course, and then there's a pogo stick which lets you bounce super high after a couple consecutive jumps, a snowboard which lets you board downhill, plowing through enemies with ease and getting some crazy momentum in the process. There's a nice pair of roller skates which basically double your move speed and you have these cool claws which let you tunnel through dirt tiles with the added bonus of a boomerang for offense. Each of these tools have a different way of attacking foes as well, though you do lose your fart attack when you pick up a gadget. Now, honestly, most of the gadgets give you the ability to just Goomba stomp your enemies. Your fart attack is probably still your best offensive option though, great hitbox and good range too. Thankfully you can switch back to your normal form whenever you want so you always have access to it. I'll say here though that only some of these gadgets are genuinely fun to use, which by extension does hurt the levels that are built around the ones that I didn't find particularly fun. I love the pogo stick, parachute, and the digging claws. I find the levels are designed around these specific tools to be pretty fun. I think it's mainly because the gadgets are a bit slower and easier to control. Pogo stick levels like this one are really really fun. The wind current levels with the parachute are also very fun and the digging levels are decent too. It might also help that with these levels your ways to defend yourself are pretty strong. The skates and the snowboard though are pretty annoying for two different reasons. One, the game expects you to platform with the skates but I guess to make them more realistic you don't come to a complete stop on landing. You always move forward just a little bit, which makes the platforming a bit awkward and imprecise. More annoying is in the levels where you're skating forward whilst being harassed by an enemy in the background, the screen doesn't move forward fast enough, so a lot of the time you're just kind of awkwardly skidding about in the middle of the screen, avoiding bombs and hoping things will go forward quicker so you can end this level. On the opposite side of that complaint, the snowboard goes way too fast for the screen to keep up with. In your speed-based platformers like Sonic the Hedgehog, you generally have some screen space in front of you so you can react to what's coming. You kind of have to have amazing reflexes or just memorize the level completely to clear it easily. It could just be my old man reflexes too, though, I won't lie. I just never felt like I had enough time to react to things coming. Okay, so let's talk about enemies in the game for a sec. They're all very kitty and fun. Each of the basic foot soldiers of the BB Brigade are mice under the orders of Commander Chu and of course under Battler as well. The enemies have a ton of different weapons, much like you. They have mortars, hang gliders, and even disguise themselves as women to try to get you. How vile. Anyway, in Punky Skunk, you have eight islands to play on, with each having five levels apiece. Four normal levels with a boss level at the end. The one common quality each of these levels is that they're all pretty short, most not taking more than 10 to 15 minutes to clear. Even shorter with the earlier levels. The overworld map also gives you a hint as to what kind of level you'll be facing as well. Like here, you can see levels will be snowy, and this level is is going to be in Egypt. The best part about the levels in this game is they're all incredibly bright and colorful, with them being super diverse and interesting looking. These levels are also very alive with a ton of active background and foreground elements too, it's great. Setting wise, you'll be encountering everything from regal frog palaces, ancient Egypt, and screen forests, mushroom forests, and medieval castles even. Legoland! Because what kid wouldn't want to go there? I find the big, um factory town to be the strongest looking area though. Got these giant cat statues, giant penguins, and giant eggs too. I wonder what gets made here, and if I could eat those big eggs. 
Jeez! Honestly, though, I think the Snow Island might be my favorite overall. I'm very partial to snow levels in games, though. Blame my affection for the winter season. And look, Christmas lights. Maybe this could have been a Christmas game in some other year. A couple of levels have pun names, too, like Tomb Waiter as well, so, I mean, that's funny. But after you clear those basic levels, you'll be faced with a boss, namely Commander Chu and whatever diabolical machine he's concocted to stop you. Except in the first island, where he simply kidnaps your friend Nash. I'll talk about each of these fights very briefly. Fight 1, Whack-A-Mole. Be sure to only hit Chu, since if you hit one of the decoys, it bursts your fart into flames, and they will all hurt you if they touch you. Fight 2, catch Chu's bombs and toss them right back at him. Only use the blue bombs to weigh and counterweigh your catapult, though. Otherwise, it goes boom. Fight 3, Volleyball. Oh my god, this is the worst one by far. Like, it just, it just doesn't work right. Anytime I went to smack the ball, I'd get hit. I jump to hit the ball, I get hit. I get lucky and hit the ball somehow and it just goes out, so I lose the round. What the fuck? It was really frustrating because I had to hear this <laughs> non-stop. But I ended up figuring it out. To actually hit the ball, you have to be moving forward when you go for the strike. Always in the air, on the ground. It doesn't matter as long as you're pressing forward on your D-pad. You will hit it fine. After that is a boat race. You mash some buttons and try to jump over some sea mines. I say try because, man, I really feel like these mines have some very generous hitboxes. Then comes Quick Draw, which is pretty simple too, but it does get quite hard come the last few shots of the contest. After that, the next boss battle isn't Chew, but it's your friend, Nash, under mind control. He's probably the easiest boss fight overall. All, I can't lie. After beating some sense into Nash, he hands you the final new gadget of the game, the jetpack comes with a flamethrower too, which you immediately use to leave orbit and assault the space base of Badler himself. After two more normal levels, you face off against Commander Chu again in an ascending battle, which honestly isn't terribly hard. I feel like I'm saying that a lot, unless I'm referring to the fucking volleyball game, of course. After you trounce him, you meet up with the big bad himself, though. Badler has a few moves up his sleeves to deal with you. He can call down the thunder, and he can bust out Shadow Clone Jutsu with a side of spinning mixer, and then he pulls out his ultimate technique and... Inflation fetish, Ugh. But you're too strong for that bastard and you put him down. He explodes into a bunch of mice and Punky falls triumphantly back to Earth. The day is saved and the game is beaten. On release, Punky Skunk got ravaged by reviewers, Western and Eastern alike. Admittedly, I can kind of see why it was so reviled. Most of you recited that it was too simplistic and too easy to appeal to older gamers, on top of its graphics being too dated for the time. I find these two criticisms kind of silly, admittedly. A game being too easy or simplistic isn't a bad thing. I mean, look at how dumbed down games are now and people still love them. That and calling these graphics dated is just weird to me. I think this game's art style looks good and it's probably aged a lot better than a ton of games on the PS1. My criticism with the game comes more from two of the five gadgets being unfun to use and some incredibly frustrating boss segments. Other than that though, I think this is a fine game. True, this did come out in an era where some of the heaviest hitters in platforming were coming out though. Klonoa, Symphony of the Night, Crash Bandicoot, and tons of others definitely drowned out this game entirely, but it's okay. And that's really all I can say about Punky Skunk. Shout out to my best friend Cade for suggesting this one. That'll be the end of this video. As always, dearest viewers, my name is Hades Manticore, and this year's channel is City State Manticore. Thanks a ton for watching if you did. Be sure to drop a like and a comment of any kind, too. Subscribe as well, since, as always, there's more content to come. I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye.